Um, so can we start talking about your background a bit? Mm -hmm. So you went to the um, Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Yes. And I read that there was, you hadn't been thinking about becoming a screenwriter, but there was a class assignment to write, a writing task. Mm. And you had a sort of eureka moment realising this could be a job. Yes. So I, I had started working on film sets. Well, I say working. I'd started to turn up on film sets in Glasgow, like Tiger, and just hang around. And eventually they had to pay me because I think it might have been an insurance issue. <laughs> um, but I, I loved film. I, I was obsessed with the movies. My mum, my grandparents and I, like, you know, our global video membership card had a horrific number of points on it. And so I, I always knew I wanted to work in that kind of sphere of the arts. But I had no idea that writing even happened. I thought movies just kind of were made mm. or, or just actually ended up in global video. I had no concept of it. And when I went to film school, I was really pleased that I wasn't going to have to write an essay. And then they were like, you have to do a screenwriting module. And I was like, oh, I didn't come to film school to write things. <laughs> and I was really belligerent about it. And then um, at the first kind of, the, the first lesson, the tutor Richard Smith said, I just want you to go and write a story this like bring it next week, it can be anything, it doesn't need to be a script, it doesn't need to be in screenplay form. And I kind of like, you know, procrastinated. And on the Sunday before it was due, I wrote the story about two guinea pigs trying to kill their owner, which we had two guinea pigs at the time and they were quite menacing. And I remember I sat down to write it and time just disappeared. I had so much fun doing it. It was such a weird, enjoyable, like four hours. And then I was really embarrassed because I totally like mocked this assignment. And so I turned up and I, I handed it in and he read it and he was like, oh, this is really good. This is really weird. OK, so next week I'd like you to write me a bank robbery. And so he just started setting task after task after task. And I think by the end of that year, I sort of had unwittingly become a writer. And when we were kind of then pitching our careers, I was studying cinematography and screenwriting. So I was very much leaning into cinematography. And um, Richard was like, why don't you go and study screenwriting? And I was like, well, can you make a living at that? And he was like, I don't know, probably. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> I don't know, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so then you went to the National Film and Television School. Yes. And you did screenwriting there, I'm guessing. I did. So I did my master's down there, where if you say, can I make a living at screenwriting? They say, yes, absolutely, um, which is very helpful. So I did two years down there. And it's, it's a great, it's a really intensive course. You do nothing but write, but you get to make short films, you make animations, kind of extracurricular, because it's such a, the NFTS is such an institution. It's all about filmmaking and TV. It's great. And so I did two years there, and I came out of there with an agent. Like, I came out of there sort of ready to be a professional writer, apart from I didn't really know what I was doing, and I was also a bartender. <laughs> and you wrote your first script just after you left. Yes. And you, might, and you sold that script. Yes. So I, I had a very good agent. Um, <laughs> I had this idea when I was still at film school at the NFTS. And we, you ha part of the module, you have to write one act plays that go on at the Soho Theatre so that you have to experience sort of this live reading of your work, which is terrifying. And um, the sort of the idea for that, my agent kept saying to me, just go and write this into a feature length script. Just go and do it. Uh, and so I, I think I spent like spent like a, like a solid six weeks just constantly writing this, writing this, and then I gave it to her, and it was very strange and really so violent, <laughs> so murdery. Um, and I remember thinking, like, she might phone the police. Uh, but she didn't. She phoned people in America, and um, <laughs> she people in America, and she said, give us money for this, and they did. And it got into a little bidding war, much to my complete delight. Because um, I didn't have money. Uh, I, again, bartender, really broke. And um, yeah, and I think she phoned me, her and my lawyer. I had to get a lawyer at the same time. She was like, listen, you're going to need a lawyer because we're going to sell this in America. And I was like, good luck. Pipe dream. That's fun for you. Mm. Um, and yeah, I got a phone call one night at the bar being like, oh, can you take your 15 minute break? Come outside and sit down. We've got news for you. Wow. And they, they were telling me shocking amount of money. And I was like, oh my God, you can make a living. <laughs> um, and then I, I phoned my mum right after it and I was like, you can make a living. And then, um, and yeah, and that was it really for me. I, from that point on, I went out to America to meet with them to like continue development. I signed with my agents out there at CAA and they introduced me to John Logan, who hired me in Penny Dreadful, and also to Darren Aronofsky, who hired me to do The Good Nurse. Yeah. So everything kind of gets set Amazing. in motion very quickly. 
Was it scary? How did it feel? Oh my god, it was terrifying. Yeah. I also, because I'd, I'd never been to LA, yeah. I don't know if you can tell, I'm very pale, so I don't do the sun well. So I was frightened of the sun from the get-go. Um, I had no money and I didn't realise they were giving me per diems. So they'd put me up in a fancy hotel and I was walking to like, basically like a super drug and buying meal deal sandwiches every day. And on the day I checked out, they were like, you've not spent any of your per diems, here's $800. And I was like... <laughs> Um, yeah, it was it was so far away from my world. Like I had no real kind of understanding of Hollywood. Like I had never experienced that. I don't know anyone in the film industry. I didn't grow up with like parents or anything that did that. So it it felt really far away mm. from my world. But also it felt like a mad adventure. And it was and, and the thing is like it doesn't matter if you're in the film industry in Glasgow, if you're the Royal Conservatoire, if you're the NFTS, if you're you anywhere in the world, people just love movies. They're there because collectively you want to try and make a good movie or a good TV show. And I think, see, as soon as you do that, kind of doesn't matter about anything else. It's, it's not worth being intimidated because yeah. they flew me business class. They must want to hear from me. <laughs> That's a very good life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that first script made it onto the blacklist. Yes. Can you tell us what the blacklist is and what that means? Yes, yeah, so the blacklist, I think it might be in its, like, 20th year now but it was uh, it was started by a bunch of kind of studio execs and uh, agents and agents assistants and they wanted to share the best like unproduced screenplays and so it started off as like this email chain uh, and then the founder of the blacklist realized that it, it was a real commodity for getting writers out there especially writers from different backgrounds um, writers that weren't the norms and also it, you know, at certain stages in Hollywood, it's very established writers that people go back to again and again. So it was about breaking people through. So it's, yeah, they, they, they can't have been made. Um, they can be in development, but they can't be in production. And it starts like that. And every year there's, I think it's 100 on the list. I think you were in year. the top 10. Yes, yes. And, um, and usually the ones in the top 10 get quite a bit of kind of heat and reading. And also a lot of other people who are learning to write look to the blacklist. I mean, I used to read a lot of the scripts that were on the blacklist as well to see, oh, this is how they're doing it and this actually feels different. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a fun way, because I think the best way to be a good writer is to read a lot of scripts. That's interesting. So did that give you, that must have given you a huge amount of confidence. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's also, it, it's hard because whenever you're making a film, you're never quite sure if anything's going to work. Yeah. And it's also, quite unbelievable a lot of the time. Like, it's very unbelievable when someone's like, we're going to make the thing you wrote in your pajamas. <laughs> and you're like, and they're like, and the budget's 100 million. And I'm like, they're insane. <laughs> they're all just insane people. So it, it, it's like a permanent state of like, am I in a coma? No, okay, I'll just keep <laughs> progressing through with life and assume this is real. So it is, it's always very weird. Um, lovely things happen. But I think if you, you can't ever really let it affect your work. I wasn't like, I'm on the blacklist, now I'm golden, I'm going to be mm. a screenwriter. I was like, I'm on the blacklist, okay, what does that mean? Who should I meet? What other like writers should I be kind of looking what's towards? So it's, yeah, it's always what's the next step. Yeah, and it's really, you said something very interesting to me earlier, because I think we sometimes have a sense that screenwriters are quite protective over what they've written, and they don't want it to maybe be ruined by the director. But <laughs> I think you said to me very interestingly that, it's the start of a process for you and it's about mm. collaboration and it's about going, being on the film set and about kind of being part of that collaboration and developing it into a great movie. Yeah, I mean, I think the really important thing, when you write a script, you're, like I say, you're often on your own or you're, you're, no, you're in a very small group of people and you're, you're just imagining it. And if it's a very lived experience, you maybe have then a complete authorship, but if it's not, you're imagining, you're reaching and you're trying to be all these different people and then you take it out into the real world. And I think it'd be foolish to think that you had worked out of those characters better than all the actors mm -hmm. that were gonna play them, or that you had picked the way that it was gonna be shot better than the cinematographer. So for me, the real joy of screenwriting is it's a collaboration. And on set, you should never be trying to prove the script is right. The script can kind of get thrown away like very quickly, because what you need to do is make a good movie. The script's the blueprint, it's the map. But if you're, if you're too slavish to it, it's more ego than it is kind of about the end result. And I think that's just a bit boring. Yeah, that's very interesting. So you then worked on Penny Dreadful, mm -hmm. uh, which is produced by Sam Mendes Production Company. And that sort of started a period of working with Sam, which culminated in 
1917 and the Oscar nomination. So can you tell us a bit about that? I mean, that's another huge step, isn't it? Yes. Um, so my first, that was my first produced film, but I had sort of been writing for about, I mean, eight or nine years at that point. Um, and, and had been, you know, getting a lot of commissions, getting a lot of scripts, kind of right up to the point. They'd be cast, directors would be on them, they'd be picking shooting windows, and then things would fall apart because it's really hard to make movies. Mm -hmm. It's expensive, it's time consuming, everyone's terrified of the kind of amount of money that's being invested. So Sam and I had two other projects that didn't happen before 1917. One was The Voyeur's Motel, which had Steven Spielberg producing it, mm -hmm. Sam directing it. Um, finished the first draft of the script and then found out the rights had been sold twice. Mm. So like Amblin Universal, we didn't own the rights. Yeah. And so that went away. And then the other one was a really research heavy one about um, this really interesting program in, in Denmark that's about sort of rehabilitating people who are inducted into sort of extreme kind of environments so like um, Islamic fundamentalism or, or like white power, like these kind of things. So they. And these police had created this system to basically bring people back away from this. And it was really extraordinary. And, and Sam and I were both obsessed with how brilliant this was. But the people who had created the programme didn't want a movie made about them. Yeah. Okay. And I really panicked because I've been hired and I'm so, like, you know, insignificant. I can't really affect that. I was very lucky that Sam was like, well, of course we won't make a movie about people that don't want to be exposed. He's like, we'll never do that. So we had had two really exciting projects fall apart both for, well, one for an annoying reason and one for the completely valid, correct reason. So it was like a long slog. It was, you know, five years or something mm -hmm. that I had been writing projects for Sam yeah. and not seeing them made films. And then he phoned me up and said, oh, yeah, uh, do you know much about World War I? And I was like, <laughs> actually, I'm kind of like a weird nerd. Yeah, I do. I know loads. And he's like, right, I want to write a story about my grandfather uh, through no man's land. Uh, he comes to my house on Tuesday. It's going to be one shot, by the way. All right, see you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I misheard that. I definitely misheard that. I had not misheard that. It's very frustrating. And then, and that was that. And in 1917, you know, from that Tuesday meeting all the way through, was like 18 months till from there till you're at the Oscars, <laughs> which is really astounding. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I guess working on those projects with Sam, the ones that didn't come about, mm. that kind of built your relationship a lot and built a lot of trust between you. Yeah. I mean, look, any any kind of part of filmmaking is about collaboration yeah. and yeah okay you really want to make sure the other person's talented but you also want to make sure that you like each other that you can spend a lot of time with each other and and also part of being a good writing partnership is that you will fight with each other mm -hmm. and that you'll fight for what you think is important and you'll bicker and argue uh, but then you know can kind of put ego aside and come back after that and so Sam and I knew each other we, we worked really well together we do work really well together it's such a pleasure He's, he's obviously an unbelievable writer and director and producer, but he's also a really good human mm. being. He's, he's a really nice man. Mm. And so it's, it's fun to make films with him. It's fun to kind of get in the trenches with him. Um, so yeah, th that's, to me, that's the most important part of collaboration is that you like them. So it's never quite that scary. Um, don't get me wrong, like sometimes you'll catch yourself arguing with Sam Mendes or Edgar Wright, and you'll be like, wait, who am I? <laughs> Oh, yeah. But you just keep going through with it because, again, they, they, they want you there. And with Sam and I, a lot of 1917, the sort of the bonuses of it was that we, we have very different outlooks. I'm a youngish woman. Mm. He's a not so youngish man. Um, do you know what I mean? Like very different kind of like cross sections of the war appeal to us. And so I think through that, you build something that in an echo chamber, neither of us would have wrote. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So it was, and how, how, how would you compare working with Sam versus working with Edgar? Because both you're working with, you know, experienced writer directors mm -hmm. and you're the co-writer and I mean the thing to me is both of them are actually really similar. I mean they're very different filmmakers, but they, they both are fantastic collaborators. They both listen to you. Um they both spend a lot of time thinking about their ideas. They're they're both not very ego driven which to me is a really important thing because I think if, if someone's too ego-driven, you can never really get around that. Um, both of them are, are just, I think, at their heart, people who want to make good stories, who want to tell, you know, interesting characters. And so that means they're really similar. The biggest difference is, you know, Edgar likes Revel and Sam likes Haribo. And if you bring enough candy, you can get them to say yes to any scene you want. You slip a... Sour cherry at Sam, and you're like, yes, <laughs> here you go. 
so going back to 1917, the thing that really struck me watching the film is that you you really get a sense of the inner lives of these characters and you're really sort of following them on their journey. And I know you did a lot of research and it'd be interesting to hear about the kind of research you did to, to, to be able to get so close to these characters who are so far away from you. Yeah, I mean, I, like I kind of think research is the most important part it's also usually the funnest part because it can involve travel <laughs> and um, and it's also not writing because the thing is is writing's actually hard like I, we can joke about it and, and it's fun but it's also like it's a real kick in the teeth from time to time um, and research isn't that research is all the possibilities and for me every project begins with a huge amount of research but then there's always a trade-off point where you're like well, now I'm just indulging myself um, and for 1917 so I knew a lot about the First World War I, I very interested in sort of like the First World War, the interwar years and World War II. So I'd, I'd, I'd read loads about it, but I'd never read first-hand accounts. Mm. So I'd never read like soldiers' diaries. And I realised because this was going to be the story of, of two men moving through it and it was going to be incredibly personal, I thought I should start with that. I was really lucky because we have the Imperial War Museum, which, mm. you know, is sort of like unbelievable yeah. um, wealth of information. And what they had in there was actually... Um, in the uh, 60s and 70s, they had had soldiers, veterans from the war, record their experiences with their voice. So I would sit and listen to these men talk about what they had lived through um, and what they had lost. And it was so personal and so intimate. Um, and it was as if I was sitting right with them. And so that really opened up those characters to me and to Sam. We, we both spent a lot of time doing that. And then the other thing is, as I went to, I, I did the route that yeah. the boys do in the film with my mum actually so the two of us did that because I couldn't quite wrap my head around a single shot film and I kept being like they go through a hedgerow and they're in another area and I was breaking up with these hedgerows and Sam was like just go out there and see how the land rises and falls and mm -hmm. and how it, it has to 1917 if you kind of look at it goes from open scene to closed scene to open scene to closed scene so that you as the audience subconsciously feel the passage of time and it's just a huge field and a wide shot um and so I went out to do that. And I think what that gave me as well is my concept of soldiers in the First World War was they were men, like they were adults that had gone to war. Mm. And what I realised in all those cemeteries, and there are so many cemeteries, and I was 30 at the time that I was writing it, I was older than everyone buried in the cemeteries. Mm. And so that was so jarring. And I remember Sam and I spoke a lot about that and about how how George and Dean needed to look young, how to cast, and, and that was a huge part of his casting, was like people that felt like mm. really young. Yeah. Um, and Dean does, Dean feels like yeah. a little boy, and it makes me really sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think you really got that sense, and you really got, I don't know, it felt like a very personal journey as you watched the film, yeah, and that really came across. Um, so uh, let's let's lighten things up a yes. bit with last night in Soho, kind of. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go from World War One to you know the horrible treatment of women in the sixties. Yeah. Um, so um, if I could please have the f the first clip from last night in Soho now. Everything all right, Ellie? Or do I call you Eloise, like the old song? I don't know that song. How do you know my name? I make it my business to know all the pretty girls around here. All their problems. Always have done. You smoke, don't you, love? No. Oh, must be thinking of some other blonde. Anyway. Be well. Was Hansi bothering you? Hansi? Yeah. Man's like an octopus. Carlo says he was the right ladies' man back in the day. Probably thinks he has a shot with you. Do you believe in spirits? What kind of a question is that? That brown stuff pays your wages. I mean, do you believe in ghosts? Ghosts? No. Why? Are you scared down here? If this place is haunted by anything, it's the good times. When it's empty, all I hear is the laughs. Every gangster, every copper, every red-faced lush has been in here. 
And all those high spirits have soaked into the walls. You could probably get drunk on just that. Yeah. Ellie, I love you, girl. You fit right in. But you can't sleep here. I love the combination of those clips because I think the first part with Terence Stamp is a kind of microcosm of the tension within the film between what Ellie is seeing and what might actually mm. have happened. But then I just love also that scene with Carol and I love the way that she cuts down Ellie's fears with the, no, I just, um, and there's a, there's a real sense of a fondness, a love for the place and kind of happy memories rather than sad memories. And that was shot in the Toucan, which is a bar in Soho where you worked. Yes. <laughs> so I felt like that really came across in that scene. And I believe you also lived above a strip club in yes, Soho did, while did, you were yeah. studying. <laughs> so it would be really interesting to hear what you brought to writing Last Night in Soho based on those experiences. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I really love research. For Last Night in Soho, I started about <laughs> eight years before. <laughs> we're in real method. Um, yeah, I suppose Edgar came to me with the story originally, and it was it's this back and forth between a woman, a, you know, a young woman in the present and a young woman in the sixties, and um, and how I actually got involved was it was Sam introduced Edgar and I and was like, you guys should be friends, you're both weird, <laughs> and um, and Edgar and I went and met for sort of dinner in Soho opposite the strip club I used to live above. We weren't in the strip club; we were a very reputable establishment, and. Um, and he, I said to him, oh, I used to live over there. And he's like, oh, I have this idea in Soho. Can you take me on a CD bar crawl? Do you know the CD bars? And I was like, do I know the CD bars? <laughs> and so we went out to many of the very CD bars and we ended up in Trisha's at like three in the morning. And he sort of told me the story of, of Eloise and Sandy. And I remember being like totally enwrapped by it. And also I, I love Edgar's films and I loved him also taking a female protagonist. I loved, I loved what he would bring to that. And it, and it really excited me, excited me about, there's a lot changed for us since the 60s, but there's a lot that hasn't. Mm. And so it felt like a really powerful and smart film, but it also be really entertaining. And he phoned me about three months after and asked me if I wanted to write it with him. And I hadn't really stopped thinking about it. But I remember saying to him, I was like, you really need to make Eloise feel believable and have and root her in the place. And like London was hard when I was living in London, it was difficult, I didn't have enough money. And the, the token for me, Carol and Colin, who are the owners, not that's an actress, but who they were named after, um, really looked after me and really made me feel safe. And it, 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 I wrote a lot of my first script, Ether, in that basement bar. I spent a lot of time there and I really loved and still do love that place and have a fondness for it. And I thought it was important to have Ellie have somewhere like that. And Edgar loved it and liked the Toucan. And so we wrote that in and I, that was sort of how we started to build in Ellie's character and Ellie's life. Um, and we had loads of research about the 60s, but Carol, who is the owner of the Toucan, had lived there in the 60s. She dated the drummer from the Rolling Stones. Wow. He used to come in and drink there. So I had this yeah. sort of network of people that had, had the most extraordinary lives that I had been plying with alcohol for years. Um, and so, so I could call on a lot of that and I could like literally physically call on them and be like, can I ask you a bunch of questions? So it, it meant the research for that was really like lovely and almost like a homecoming for me. It was a really fantastic process, even though it does deal with very dark subject matter. Yeah, yeah. wow, well, it's, it's a very fun film to watch and you feel the fondness for, for the bar. And it made me want to go and have a drink there because <laughs> I haven't been there for a long time. Um, let's move on to your current film. Yes. So that's The Good Nurse. Can we have uh, The Good Nurse trailer, please? <sighs> Hey! <laughs> What's going on? Just, you know, work's been pretty awful without you there. You and I were partners. You know, I don't want to talk about work. Is it because what they're saying is true? So, how are the girls? They're really good, but... I'm working a lot. You still owe me for last Friday, but it can wait, really. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Nurse 50, sorry about that. Thank you. Bye, Mom. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Nurse Lochran, this is Officer Braun. Do you remember Anna Martinez? Where'd she go? Yeah, her death. It was sudden. 
Mind taking a look at this? Hmm. The insulin in her system, it's a double medication error, which is really rare. We understand that you work with a Charlie Cullen. Could he be involved in this? She and their lovebirds. I cannot get over how cute your Vanessa is. Who's Vanessa? Oh my god. There's insulin in her system. He's been at nine hospitals. Nine. Oh, what do you mean? No, the hospital would have done something. You would think so, so. Yeah. Do you remember working with someone named Charlie Cullen? Yeah. There was a rumor about him. They found insulin in a dead guy's sailing bag. Hey, girls. Yeah. Come, sit. Why are you being weird, Mom? He's be killing people without ever touching them. He's gonna get a new job. And it's all gonna continue. I hope you guys can hear me. He's walking right now. Hey! <laughs> On that trailer, you'll see that it's an incredibly tension-filled film, despite the fact that it's based on this true story, so you kind of know broadly where it might be going. Um, but the thing that I, I found really interesting is how you bring out the tension and the anxiety of the character played by Jessica Chastain, mm. Amy, and her struggle to, to both do what she thinks is the right thing, but also look after her children. And I really, it was palpable to me the kind of the tension, the anxiety of her character. So um, is that something you really wanted to focus on when you started to...? Yeah, I mean, so this book got sent to me when I signed with CA. This, this was my first paid job as a screenwriter. It just took 10 years for it to get made and come out because films are hard. Um, and I remember reading the book, and I, I didn't know the story of Charles Cullen. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of him. But if you don't, between the sort of 90s and early noughties, he killed, he was convicted of, um, I think, 39 counts of murder, but the number could be between 300 and 1,000. Um, and so he systematically worked his way through hospitals in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, killing patients in intensive care, and the hostels covered it up. And so I was so, I'm the kind of person that Google serial killers at four in the morning when they can't sleep, like, I would know about this, <laughs> and I didn't. And so when I started reading the book, I was totally engrossed and I kept thinking, I can't wait to see the documentary of this. But I had no idea how to tell it as a story. And the last third of the book, Amy Loughran gets involved. And she's a single mum, she's working class, she's a nurse. She, is, um, she has horrific heart problems and her insurance won't cover it. So she's working without insurance. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to get to the sort of six month mark so that she can take a uh, paid leave so that she can go and get an operation to keep her alive. And um, so she's already a hero. Yeah. Like she's already doing something that is just beyond the capability of, of most people. And then one day the police turn up and say, you know your best friend that's been helping you and that's been keeping you alive? We think he's killed people and we think he's been killing people for 18 years. And will you help us because the hospital won't? And so to me, like, that woman's story is the story of the serial killer because I don't want to write a main kind of part for a serial killer. I'm not interested in why a serial killer did it. It's sort of horrific. And, and we never answer that in the, in the film. We never say this is why he, he killed people because we don't know. Mm. Um, but this woman who stood up against a serial killer and also a profoundly broken system to me was a superhero. And it's the kind of superhero you never hear about. Mm. I mean, women for start, working yeah. class, single mum, like you just don't, and they are superheroes, we, we never write about them, we never are told about them, we don't grow up watching them, and so it's so mysterious. 
And so when I met the real Amy and she took me into her confidence and she told me about her life and really opened her life to me. And bear in mind, I'd have been 23 at the time that I turned up at her house in upstate New York. I had no credits to my name, I knew nothing. And I was very honest when I was like, this is my first job and I really want to do it well. And she helped me. Mm -hmm. She helped me. She would kind of tell me stories. And it, when I was like, listen, I'm trying to make this feel real. And she would talk about this incredibly painful relationship that she'd had with Charles Cullen. And, and she's the reason that I think that the story should exist. Mm. And so I, I fought for her to be the main character. I kind of like, I was pitching this along with, there was other writers pitching other stories. Um, I eventually kind of like made my way through. And then I, I spent nine and a half years working on it. And a few years with Darren Aronofsky and then Tobias Lindholm came on. Mm. And then Eddie and Jessica came on and, and knowing just the caliber of, of them and, and how wonderful they are as actors, that's when we really let the script kind of air out and breathe and and let it be tense, but let it be tense knowing that it will be tense when Eddie's just standing there in that room sort of looming and I don't need to write any of that. So it was really, it was really like wonderful project to be a part of, not because it's about a serial killer, but it's actually, it's about a woman that stops a serial killer. Yeah. And that, that always excited me. Yeah. In and also it's- In an unbelievable way. As yeah, well. she's, I mean- So many Yeah, I, I don't want to ruin it because yeah. of, the spoilers, but yeah, she she does it in a way that you've never really seen anyone else do it, and and it is real. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I profoundly hate the American healthcare system for what it does, yeah. and I'm a big old socialist, yeah. and I love the NHS, and I like to just talk about social <laughs> healthcare anytime anyone lets me. I mean, it really is incredible in the film when you think about again, without going into too much detail, what how this man was allowed to yes. continue. It's well, it's like. It, if you imagine hospitals out there operate more like hotels, and if, if you know, the chef was murdering people in your hotel, you wouldn't tell anyone, because yeah. <laughs> no one would come to the hotel. And so, and that's just how those, those administrators ran it. They, they treated it, they put profits ahead of patients. And that's why, look, you're always gonna have bad people. There will always be bad people out there, but he was basically allowed to kill for so long because the system wanted to protect itself and so would stop him going to justice. Yeah, yeah. yeah when you're working, when you're telling real people's um, stories, I think the best way to do it is to work really closely with them. So, so Amy Loughran and I, the real Amy, we spent a, a huge amount of time together and um, and, and became very close friends and I respected her and she respected me and I would often say to her, I want to include this scene. I want to, I want to, can I do something like this? And if she ever felt uncomfortable with it, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't put it in the script. Um, with regards to writing about, I mean, there's, there are many victims of Charles Cullen and I had no access to them because a lot of people's families don't know their, their relatives were victims. So we very early on made the conscious choice that we would never um, identify a victim, like we would never use a victim's name. So we we basically created sort of amalgamations of victims and stuff that we'd heard, but we'd never, we never singled anyone out. So we, so we looked at the sort of cross section of the people that he killed, um, their ages, their races, like everything like that, so that it would feel representative. But we never had the right, I think, to put words in people's mouths. So the methodology he used to kill was 100% accurate, but the people that he killed were inventions and, and we we spoke to a lot of people about that to make that feel, I suppose, fair. Um and if, if anyone had have come forward at any point, I, I believe to be us and I would have really, you know, wanted to have that discussion with them and, and wanted to, to make it right. Because you, you do, you have a, a it's a privilege and a responsibility to tell true stories. I think when you're the first part of your question when you're thinking about how do you bring stuff to them? It's quite it's, it's sort of a bit ethereal that isn't it because it's 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 a very strange way I mean for me Amy Loughran was a single mum trying to make a nice life for her kids my mum was a single mum trying to make a nice life for me and so I sort of understood that woman I understood the sort of sacrifice I understood the the love and the power in that and so I, I brought a lot of that to it I think for for 1917 it's obviously I'm not a young man at the first world war but just reading their accounts and, and walking in their place and going their journey and just thinking about them as actual people, as people with hopes and dreams, as people that are not there to shoot a gun, but people there thinking about their wife at home or like how much how much it will matter that they're not there to help pick up the fallen apple blossoms. To me, that makes them real. 
It, it gives them a life outside of the 110 minutes that they're in screen for you. That's always what I'm trying to do in the very early stages. And it's sometimes people I know, it's sometimes, you know, aspects of myself, but, but ultimately it's just trying to breathe life into something so that they talk without you typing. Sometimes you're just writing down what they're saying, you're just catching up. And that, that's always when I'm feeling really good about projects when I'm writing is like, oh shit, I'm, I feel like I'm just taking notes. Mm. I'm not actually enforcing my will in them, although I secretly am. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. So I've been on set for every single one of the films I've wrote, um, which I, I find out is weird. I, it turns out they don't take a lot of writers on set. I think that's a mistake. Um, but yes, no, I love to be on set. I think it's important to have someone there that's just there to help with the story. Um, a lot of times things have to be rewritten on the day and usually the best person to do that is a writer. Um, the director's got a lot going on and so having someone there, for instance, in Good Nurse, we shot it during COVID. Um, we were on a tight budget, we didn't have a lot of time. We had to start losing scenes because we just weren't making days. And sometimes when we'd lose scenes, I'd be like, right, okay, well, there's really important information in those three scenes. So I can rewrite this scene that we're going to shoot next Tuesday and hand it to the base and just, you know, and I'll check in with the producer and I'll check in with the first AD and all that. But like, is this still on the docket for then? I think we need to extend this. Or if we've cut that, we can cut these other three. Mm -hmm. Having someone there, either an editor or a writer that's aware of what you're trying to build in the end, I think really makes everyone's life easier. And it, and it means like usually a lot less in reshoots. So for the price of what a writer will eat in craft services, you're not spending millions like four months later to try and make a film work. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really sorry to say we are definitely out of time now, but please join me in thanking Christy for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.